Ooh, that looks tasty. Welcome, folks. Today, the Hungry Gamer is back with another episode of Boards and Brews. And today, I'm joined again for like the fourth time by a man who makes mistakes, Don <laughs> Baggett from the Secret Cabal. And Don, we only got two rapid fire questions for our fourth timer. And just I want you to know, you are one punch away on your card from a free episode. So, am I really? Yeah, oh, you're man. close. You're I love close. It. But what have you been up to since the last time you were on? And what is your brewed beverage? And we were just talking. I, it's possibly been over a year since you were last on. Yeah, I think it's been a while. Um, was it? It might have been in the middle of COVID. It's when you and I first met, right? You had reached out to me, and we had a a, a, a boards and brews conversation. That's been quite a while. It's been long enough that you visited a couple times, and like I've had you in my house, which is dangerous for your listeners to know. But you know, yeah, everybody, I just want you to know. So, so they, if you watch, listen to watch. If you listen to Secret Ball, they always talk about does Don has so many games, and so my wife and I were <laughs> over there for a game day, and if you're watching the video, you can see just a couple of uh, cubes of, of games behind him, and there's I don't know, maybe there's two. Two two by fours, which you can see behind him. Maybe he's got, I don't know, 14 of those, 14 by four behind him, something like that. And I was like, that's not that many. And he opened a door to like the stacks. <laughs> like they, he has aisles of games in the secret back room. It's yeah. it's it's amazing. And they're constantly in flux too. I have aisles of games in the secret back room. I've got a pile over here of stuff that's going out. It's like I have this this conveyor belt of games that are coming in and going out at any given time. I've got stuff I'm packing out on the table upstairs, all over the place. Now, um, a, a friend of mine, uh, Corey Thompson, he used to do Dice Tower now. And he has other stuff he does, but he literally has stacks like in a library with a crank. Oh, and, are you serious? Yes, and they move and they they you know smush together, and you gotta you know like crank them in and out. And yeah. on the inside of his house, he has a very you know uh, uh, like a ranch house, so very high ceilings. He has like one of those rolling library ladders. And so what I'm wow. saying is, you have you can improve, sir. That's right. I have. Yeah, trust <laughs> me. My wife is. Uh, she will confess she's happy with what I have now. That way, I won't go any further. So yeah. <laughs> So I'm what I've been doing? Just knock play- out the ceiling. Just knock out the ceiling. <laughs> I don't know you if know? that'll go well. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's uh, so what have I been doing? Uh, we chatted. Uh, like I said, I think it was in the middle of the pandemic. So a lot of games. Uh, of course, my uh, my daughter is now in college. She was not in college when we first met and first did the, the other boards and brews. Uh, my son is about to graduate college. So exciting times around the Baggett household. The children are. I mean, my wife and I are close to becoming sort of empty nesters, at least in the college sense. So we're having to, uh, you know deal with that it's actually a pretty interesting ride my kids are uh they got good heads on their shoulders they must have got that from their mom so i didn't i didn't hurt them too much now so the real question is how many school breaks does your son or daughter have to miss before their room (laughs) turns into a game room (laughs) it wouldn't have to be long if they were out here about four days (laughs) well the real danger is not me turning to a game room it's my wife turning into a sewing room that's what happened with the guest bedroom, which leaves us in need of a guest bedroom. So I think she's like, Kalen, going off to school, be an adult. That way we can have this room and use it as a guest bedroom. It could go somewhere far away. So, you That's know. right. <laughs> How am I going to miss you if you don't get out of here? <laughs> yeah. But most parents are like, oh, stay close to home. You're like, could you go to Australia or something? <laughs> she's actually gone overseas. I mean, we footed the bill for that. I never got to do anything like that when I was a kid growing up in lower Alabama, right? It's like, we, you know, I. Our definition of adventure was we got to go to Pizza Hut, and that was a big deal. Ooh, uh, you know, it's definitely good to get out of Europe like her. Yeah, my 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 wife. Some people in my wife in my wife's family are very much like that. To where, um, and this is not denigration or anything, but they just their lifestyle is different, and getting on a plane is frightening. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's understanding what do I do going to the airport, and like I heard her you explain it. Do you do this? You do this? And I was like, what is going on? It's just like. They've been on one plane in their life. Yeah. So it's just a very, it's a very, very different thing. And one day Alabama will get planes. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> Welcome to the 21st century. <laughs> yeah. They, they got people doing the crank. Yeah. And to, all right, but anyhow. So, so, so that's what, the first answer. That, that's what I'm doing. I haven't told you yet what I'm drinking. Okay. Yes. yes. So this is a special one. Usually, you know, I'm a big fan of the IPAs. Um because because do you like bad beers? Yeah, exactly. Right. We've gone over this before. Today, I have one that's not an IPA. Today, I have one called Mad Elf. 
And Mad Elf is a red holiday ale. It's got a taste of cherries. The dangerous part about it is it's 11%, so it's a higher alcohol by volume. Uh, like I said, it's a red ale. It doesn't taste like that, though. This is something I discovered. My wife actually discovered it. She went to a an office Christmas party at some pub around here, and she said, man, we, I tried this this drink. It was so good. It was called Mad Elf. And this was around, you know, Christmas time. So I went and got a case of it and because uh, she liked it so much. And that was a year ago. Since then, I bought a year and a half ago, I take it back. I bought another case in October last year. And so I've still got half a case here. And I figured, you know what? Let's break out one of these because it really is a great beer. And it's from um, Trogues. It's it's a seasonal beer. So, you know, it comes out in the not Novemberish time frame. And usually they have some in stock until like you get into February, maybe early March. But then it's sort of you know, out of stock for months and months and months. Really good sort of holiday beer. And you didn't dump that down my throat when I was just out there? I I wish I'd remember to. Oh I wish I'd realize gosh. it, man. Unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, I have a, it's, it's not usually I record this in the morning because it's just where, where people are in their lives. But it's 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 a respectable hour right now. So I'm drinking a, 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 a my, my usual Fort Point Kolsch, which is not an IPA because no one really likes IPAs. Just no one does. Just a, no. One day you'll grow up and be a real boy, William Brown. <laughs> well, I mean, is my hair going to fall out as fast? <laughs> I don't know, man. It's going. I feel like it's the lack of IPAs, which is what's holding it holding it together right now. That could very much be. Yeah. I mean, who knows? You stop drinking IPAs. It might all just come back overnight. Well, yeah, maybe I'll give it a shot. I doubt it, though. <laughs> all right. So it is actually April Fool's Day right now. And so everybody and their mother puts out fake nonsense today. Have you seen any board game April Fool's nonsense? And if you have, what have been your favorites? I actually have not, unfortunately. I was hoping you would have a list because I've been at work. There's been some some April Fool's stuff. I'm a, I'm a manager at work when I showed up. Somebody had sent me an email that said, hey, there's this thing about, uh, you know, everybody's giving time off awards to people so they can go see the eclipse that's happening in a few days. And I was like, Really? And I was going to go check it out. Then I realized what a troublemaker he was and then found out, of course, that was a April Fool's prank. Yeah, my, my wife's company, she, she sent me a text. She got in there. Someone had put up a sign that said the coffee machine's now voice activated. <laughs> That's good. And she's like, you know, a lot of people. <laughs> you know, they, they, they're in early. They're like, coffee, please. And just a bunch of people standing there staring standing at Standing there. Yep. Um, so I've, I, I saw a couple today and two of them stuck out to me. One was Cardboard Alchemy, who does Flamecraft, put out an ad that you could now get a Flamecraft toaster, which <laughs> had the cute little dragons on it. But when you toasted your bread, the bread would also come out with a cute Flamecraft dragon, like, you know, extra dark in the middle of it, which I thought was good. Because, like, to be fair, they could sell that. Like, yeah. they'd, make, they'd make another million dollars. You know, you never can tell with the way what board game companies and designers and distributors are doing now, right? Those kind of things. It's like, you know, I've gotten games that have, um, that actually have like a, a VHS tape. Like they found out a way to make a VHS tape or like, a cassette a tape. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the names of the, the guilty would be withheld. So nobody will go trying to find this stuff. But yeah, it's cool stuff. You, did you have a VHS player? No. I was <laughs> no. Saying, like, so how, how do you watch it? I tossed that thing. What are you talking about? Oh, you got room for the other games. Oh, okay, okay. So some of them. Not, I was thinking of a recent Kickstarter. And the other one I, I saw that I thought was was pretty good was uh, Final Frontier Games, which was Merchant's Cove and Coloma and all those. They put out a press release that they partnered with Ziploc. Mm -hmm. So now every single game will have 10 uh, high-quality resealable bags. Nice. Um, but yeah, not, only, only a couple this year. I know Chip Theory Games always does like a a fake too many bones promo but it's actually real that you can get but it's fake but it's real like yeah jamie posted something that jamie's the host of the secret ball game podcast the main host right and uh he posted a link yourself they definitely done something this year you 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 could you should start pushing for top billing no i'm just a sidekick man at best yeah because then, then if you're top billing you got to do all that uh all that admin work all that work yeah yeah <laughs> you, i can't be you, trusted with that kind of power will let's face it you just show up, play some games, and have a few drinks. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and then you say, have fun shipping all that stuff. <laughs> hey, we've actually done that together before. Now Jamie pays for somebody to do that. But we there was a time we got together, like went to the warehouse and like packaged everything up. But I think the high rate of <laughs> the high rate of errors might have dissuaded Jamie from doing that ever again. 
And you know, and I bet it was fun for like an hour or two. And then you're like, actually, it was it wasn't too bad. This was right when the pandemic started. I remember when somebody had to ship, and so we all got together and we all had our masks on and stuff. Uh, it was it was a fun time. Like I said, I mean, but we 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 were partnering with one of these uh one of the cabalists. That's what we call our listeners, right? One of the cabalists that you know had a place where he had access to these things. He worked for a place and got got permission to sort of buy the packing stuff, but they didn't have enough to accommodate. So we were trying to patch things together and do the best. And I think some glasses broke in transit stuff more than should have because you, of that. Because you, so, you wrapped them in your t-shirt that you just pulled them off right, and exactly. put it in there. <laughs> um, but, right. but my favorite yeah. packing story happened when that happened because we have uh um, cabalist cards, right? These are like membership cards, fake membership cards. But they're, they're well-made, right? Sort of sturdy. And I remember I, uh, packed out a card for, let me see here. Let me get the name right. So there was a card you go through and you see these names, like some you would recognize, you know, because you've seen them in the forums or you met them at conventions or something like that. But every once in a while, there was one that you didn't recognize or you come across and be like, oh, that sounds like somebody. And I, I think, I'm pretty sure there was one that actually went to, there was one that actually went to uh, a place in California, if I remember correctly. I want to make sure I get the name right. And it was for a Randolph Parker the Third in California. I think it was California. So uh, we weren't sure who this was. I looked at it. I'm like, wait a second. And that is the third, Randolph Parker the Third is actually Trey Parker. Trey Parker is one of the co-creators of oh, South yeah, Park. Oh, yeah, yeah, South Park, yeah. And, and he, we know he's into board games, but we didn't know if he was a listener or not. This seems to suggest he was, and that was like, I was sitting there holding that car thinking, wow, this is cool. <laughs> about to package up this dude's stuff. So and probably you kept got it, it instead, and now he's no longer a listener. <laughs> I should have. <laughs> the funny thing is, I had backed it too at that time, because this was right when I was making the changeover from being a listener to on the podcast, and so I'd already backed it, right? And somebody actually packed up mine. To, to ship out to me well even though we were there because we're moving so fast <laughs> yes yeah, it's, it's it's so so fast you were doing like three a minute <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we actually got to where it was we were moving and you'd be surprised i mean you know well, i mean once the packing ran out you just like slammed the glasses in there <laughs> right. you just, just <laughs> crash them all together give about enough to recreate a glass and ship that thing off now it was fun we, we were actually there all day and still didn't finish uh you know i was sort of amazed by you know uh you know i didn't know and I think I'm in some sort of denial even to this day about, you know, a lot of people actually listening to the podcast. Uh, and so, you know, you pack those things all day. You're like, man, we're packing a lot of stuff. There's a lot of people that are listening and backing that we appreciate very much. Right. And uh, that we're talking to when it, whenever we get together, like we're talking, you and I, we're talking here. Right. But people will watch it or hear it. And we record our podcast, thousands upon thousands of people listen to it. And I sort of, I'm just in denial about, us having that kind of reach, right? And it's so funny. I think about, you know, um, where I work for the government. People know me. I'm fairly well known, uh, but not near the people that know me from the podcast, right? It's just so weird to think like that. Yeah, because I mean, it's, it, I bet I bet it is 20 times the amount of people who back the campaign listen. Actually similarly. listen? Yeah. It may be. I don't that, know. That, that, that'd that be my guess. Um, because, you know, like, it's just it's a it's a lot of people, and you guys have been doing it a long time. Um, that's why I keep having you on. You know, you you, you raise my prestige. You know, <laughs> excellent. Like Happy this episode will get you know forty downloads. I'll tell you one thing we did do since you and I have last chatted. We stood up the Discord, the Secret Cabal Discord, um, and that thing is like off the hook. It's it's uh, if you ever create something, you know how they say the internet, nobody really knows how it not how it works, but you know, is in totality, no one can sort of. Uh, you know, uh, visualize or articulate how, what a beast it's become, right? It's like, nobody knows the extent to which this thing is out there. And, uh, I kind of feel like the discord is like that. We started up, people jumped in and we've got this welcome channel that says, welcome. It's just lists of thousands of names. And these people jump in and will create topics all over the place. And like, I'll get in there late. You know, I'll check it one day and like a topic's 35 posts in and it's gone off the rails. And I'm thinking, man, this is you know, it just gets sketchy. There's memes and photos all over the place and people making jokes. Right, so, so thinking, now, this I, is the I, cabal nation. Yeah, no, I, I'm in there. I'm in there. And where where do I need to go for the weird, the weird stuff? Like, that's what I want to see. I, I want to yeah. see, like, where's the weird crap happening? That's I don't I'm know if it's for. weird, but the, the craziest part is the memes. Sometimes a meme channel just goes 
crazy. I'll get texts from my friends. My buddy Shannon will text me and be like, yeah, the, the meme channel's blowing up. And somebody new will get in there and just go meme crazy and just put all kind of stuff in there. If you ever need a, a laugh, just go in there and scroll down. There'll be 20 new things, memes yeah, people I, have grabbed. I have been there. spending a, a good chunk of time in some of the, uh, just the photo. Yeah. Uh, the pictures of people put on games and painting and stuff. I, that, that I enjoy um, quite a bit. And I, I'm afraid to put pictures of stuff I painted because I'm like, <laughs> I'm not actually good. Like, you know, my, my method is slop and drop. You know, it looks yeah. better than it looks better than gray. Slop some stuff on, put on the table. But then, you know, some of those people don't go down the rabbit hole of like going on Instagram miniature painters. Cause like those things, they look some it looks like real fire. It's like, what is happening here? I'm just gonna sit here with my four colors. Yeah, Jamie does a really good job, man. We just recorded an Express episode. He taught out one of the best Kickstarters he's done is, uh, I think, I can't, the, the, I'm the, the, the name Duncan right. Rhodes thing. It was yeah. some paint, a uh, kind of paint that he picked up. Yeah, the, the Duncan Rhodes painting. Oh, account. okay. I yeah. listened. I Sorry, listened. I'm just checking you out. there. Good job. Now, that's, why, that's why you sometimes get messages from, from me that probably have nothing to do with anything because you recorded <laughs> this thing two weeks prior, but I just listened to it. And I'll say, I was like, oh, no, I was like, you, you really do want to check that out. You're like, okay. And then I know it totally makes no sense just because I'm two weeks in the past from you. Yeah, so um, he does a lot of painting and I've seen some of his miniatures and they're gorgeous, man. He, you know, he does a really good job. Now I can never do anything like that. I don't have the eyesight for it. I don't have the patience for it. Uh, you know, I would probably just start painting and be like, whatever, man, this thing will look good all red. But I do I like mean, to be fair, games it that does. Push, right. You just put, you, you can put like two colors on a thing. It looks so much better than the gray. <laughs> Yeah. I've got, so I actually got my Cthulhu Death May Die set uh, painted by a buddy, a Kabbalist, Ben Waxman is his name. Actually lives out in California, I believe, near you. So I'd say near you, like as if California doesn't cover the whole West Coast of the it's United just one States. State. It's no big deal. <laughs> a state of confusion. <laughs> you can you, you can technically drive drive all the way up and, up and down in a day. Like 24 it, hours. Yeah, 24 yeah. hours. Like exactly. actually 20, yeah. Oh, before I forget, this is your official invite to DonCon 3. Oh, you keep pushing this on me. No, it's, re it's we finally got the dates, which I can't remember, but they exist. <laughs> it's 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 a thing. It's real. It's got a tag. It's got a catchphrase. I'm sure there are some Dons out there that listen to the podcast. If it's yeah. is it for all Dons or is there a list of Dons? It, uh, it, that I don't know, <laughs> but they're the only two Dons that I know. I'm even wearing the shirt. The waiting, waiting on, on Don. Don shirt. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> now it's a. Uh, I mean, it's got a got a got a tagline. You know what it is, right? It's just Don Con three. Don Don Don. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so we can get two more Dons. It's on. So it's that's a right. thing. It would be at capacity. Yeah, it's, <laughs> that's funny. There's only room for three Don. There's only room for three Dons. People. Let's <laughs> that's good. let's simmer down. All right, but let's actually talk about what what we're here. And that's not what we're here for. So we're going to talk just about some games we've been playing lately. We're going to talk a little bit about, about crowdfunding shenanigans. Because people are all bent out of shape about the latest shenanigan that companies are doing with the pay a dollar before you pay a dollar. Yeah. A couple of other things. And then we're going to finish by talking about a game that I know you don't like, but we're going to talk about it anyway called Res Arcana. Hate it. Yeah. Now, so starting now, I'll let, I'll let you go first. What have you been playing lately? And then we'll kind of finish up with what are the, the, like the very next games you got coming. Yeah, so, so just a, go ahead and pick just, one first. Just a few nights ago, I played one that I've been waiting on for a long time. It actually was crowdfunded, I think, through GameFound about four years ago. Maybe it hasn't been that long, but it's been a while. Long enough that you know how these go, these Kickstarters go, or, or or crowdfunding projects, I should say. Right, they'll have a date listed. Here's what we're planning on delivering, and that date is basically a thing that will not happen. That's exactly mm -hmm. what that is. And so that comes, and you have some relatively naive crowdfunders that go. Man, this thing, they said they were going to deliver in August 21 or, you know, whatever. It's like, man, these things never deliver. You got to go, you pledge your money, and then you forget about that thing, and it'll show up at some point is the way I kind of look at it. And uh, the weird thing is when one does arrive on time or early. Yeah, I've had one like, do that too. You're like, what? Right. What Wait, is this what? sorcery? What is this? Am I going to have just a bunch of rocks in here? You know? <laughs> yeah, so anyway, I... I, I yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Okay. Anyway, okay. I'll go. I, I think I've had like, I don't know. I've now, you just went through and did your stats. I'm not, I haven't done no 500 campaigns, but I think I've had like three deliver early 
am like five roughly on time within like you know a month yeah of the other thing and all, all the rest not even close i got one that i lived in a different house i worked at a different job <laughs> i had not met you <laughs> you were not on the podcast and it's still like a year out yeah like supposedly they, those and, kind and of they had a two-year right? finish line they put their date two years out when i backed it and i was like damn well I it's guess so it'll be funny though i mean everything has been disrupted by a pandemic right uh for years including as you you know talking about shipping costs and we've talked about this on the, on the podcast quite a bit which is you know it's kind of wrecking some companies that were on that bleeding edge of profitability right and when that shipping went up and storage went up uh you know the price of component uh you know yeah, just cardboard went up cardboard Everything went up by like 70 percent or something and they were so close on the line that like it kind of put them under right we've seen that more and more and i think it will unfortunately continue a bit but this one that i i crowdfunded with tons and tons and tons of other people they were starting to really complain i mean even a couple of years ago there you know how it goes i mean it's a month late and people are like we're never going to get this and you know and this was actually from uh portal games so this was actually a <clears throat> a, a, a well-known publisher and a well-known designer and a well-known game this was the newest version of they had already done one sort of revamped version. This is the newest version. That's Robinson Crusoe Adventures on the Cursed Island. Oh, it delivered. It did, yes. And I got, I went all in. I got the, you know, in the base game, you have uh, little uh, pawns and those, and by pawns, I just mean discs, right? And those discs actually, uh, you know, show which actions you're taking in around, where you're, where you're sort of investing your time. And in the blinged out version, you have washed Awakened Realms type minis. In fact, I think Awakened Realms might have done that. Uh, they might have partnered with Awakened Realms because it was on GameFound. Uh, so you have those. You have when you're building up your, you know, your 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 shelter. There's an actual washed sun drop shelter that you're building up. You know, there are tokens for like if you get a basket, it helps you gather. You get a, a little basket miniature. And I looked at that and I was like, this looks cool, but. I just don't know how usable it is, right? I mean, it's just there's some some kludginess there so whenever well, you it go sounds like the castles of burgundy super yes. deluxe yeah but like castles of burgundy at least it all fits on the board and it looks cool and everything this is more like okay i don't know where to put this oh. shelter like you could put it to the side but then what well, no, you build tracking... it around you <laughs> yeah, it's about that big <laughs> so as you build your palisades up or whatever you add <laughs> palisades to it but it's hard to tell You'd have to sort of track it on the board, too, because it's hard to just look at that thing and know what your Palisades level are, and you have to be taking them on and off. And the Awakened Realms minis, as good as they are, as detailed as they are, they're not the most uh, flexible, right? So you could very easily break that stuff if you're not very careful with it. So a lot of handling. Bottom line is we didn't play with that stuff, even though I'd gotten it, because it was like, I just kind of... I want you to in the mood to just break, break a bunch of toys. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and I thought it would add a little more complexity than I wanted to just from a physical, tangible touch stuff and move things around point of view. Right. The, the beauty of it is though, play the game. It remains one of the best games I think ever made. Right. And sort of I think what I think of as a, a prototypical uh, co-op game. That's extremely fun. And and once you play it a couple of times, it's not complicated, right? You can track what's going on in the round and it makes sense. There's a lot of cool mechanisms in the game. Now you've played this game before, Will? No, I haven't. And so a, a, a deer, I, I know, I know it's okay. Oh but man, that's I, a... I might be back out in April. We, we can play. All right. Um, so a, a dear friend of mine who actually just, just re fairly recently passed, he loved oh. that game and he really, really wanted to, to play it. And he was explaining it to my wife. And she stopped and, and you know, because you'd lose, you play that game to lose, is my understanding. Yes, you do. And she was like, why would you think anybody would be happy if I played that game? <laughs> it, was, it was her response. And so I, I've never played it for that, but uh, I, I've always, I've always been tempted. I've always been tempted. Everyone says it's great as long as you're, you know, just ready to lose. Yeah, it's not about winning or losing. It's <clears throat> about the journey. And there's a, a few things that this game adds, which are, you know, one of the things that I was happy to get was in the base game, I think there's seven or eight scenarios. Maybe there's more. I don't know what it is. But I got the a book that it, it has like a hundred scenarios in it. It's all the fan made stuff, all the stuff they released over the years in a nice format. So we actually played, uh, you know, the island, the adventurous island of King Kong or something like that. So it was like it, Robinson Crusoe has now become this sort of 
um, framework in which you can have different scenarios. So there's tons of stuff, time travel stuff, uh, cult stuff, zombie stuff that use the base rules to play. And the setup and the rules change just a little bit, and they you know do another sort of uh, scenario. Really cool stuff. And that's of all the things I got in that that Robs the Crusoe crowded funding campaign. That's all the right. thing. I'm all you saw me the next next time I'm out, or when you come to DonCon three, we'll, we'll, we'll make it happen. But you know, get those palisades painted. Yeah, so we're ready wow. to go. Well, no, I did. All brown. Well, you know, because we talked about because uh, last time you were on, you were just as upset when I said I'd never played Castles of Burgundy. Yes, which, which I now have. Excellent. And it was funny. I played it on a lot on BGA because my other Don, he loves it also, and he got the new thing. He didn't get the minis for everything because he was like, "That seems excessive, and it's hard to know what is. you're looking at." He didn't yeah. get the castle minis though, which do look great. And so I don't know. We've played fifty games on board games. Really? Yeah. Like on board? There's so many of these games. I'm terrible. I've never won. I got within like ten <laughs> once. I was like so happy. That's called and, a win. And we're playing. And uh, my brother, designer of uh, Lunar Rush, was out here playing too. And I kept stopping. I was like, "What are you doing?" They're like, "That's that's the rules of the game." Turns out I didn't know how to play the game. I thought I did because BGA does it all for you. Yeah. So I just thought I knew. I didn't know. I had no idea. All these things like, what? no, you can't do that. It's like, no, that's the rules. I was like, but why did you take the points? Because that's the rules. And it was just like a repeated thing. But so I finally played. That is That actually is a very good game. I'm with mm-hmm. you now. And I'm so glad he didn't have a mini for every single building. Yeah. It, it takes someone's full-time attention to swap those things out when you're playing with it. It does look cool when all is said and done. But I think the next time I'm going to play it, I'm just going to play it with a straight you know, I got the bait light tiles. Just play with yeah, those. yeah. The, the, those are real nice, and use the actual castles because you know what the castles do, and it it looks great. We we even played with one of those, like the newest expansion, like the vineyard or whatever. Oh yeah, I haven't played that yet. Oh, it's good. I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna give you this. This is for free. Okay. Don't ignore the vineyard, or you're gonna lose. Okay. Like All I'm right. pretty sure it's not one of those things. Like you can play some games. You like you know I'm gonna ignore this thing and do this and still win. I don't think you can win if you ignore that. So that that that's that's for free for you. So the most recent one I played, it's a review copy, a preview copy of this game called Formosa Tea, which is a, a Taiwanese game about the history of tea and the growing tea and then drying the tea and then selling the tea. And, you know, as exciting as, of a theme as that is, <laughs> I was like, ah. I don't know, but, you know, it's kind of cool when a company out of Taiwan reaches out. And so I was looking at it because this is a game that's already published and they're making changes and it's got some cool stuff. It's this very cool engine that you have to send your farmers out and pick the tea. There's three different types of tea. And then you can only have, and and depending on how wet it is, because each column of the, the grid has different weather. If it's very rainy, it's very wet tea. And of course, to have tea leaves, they have to be dried and all that stuff. And so... Then you send your tea master into the factory for each different type of tea, and you're trying to get the tea dried and then get extra flavor into it. And then once you do that, then you get to move it and try to sell it. And if the tea is still a little bit wet, you have okay tea. If the tea is totally dry, you have excellent tea. And if it's wetter than that, you just got a, a bunch of bullshit. Like, I don't, I don't know. They send it to Garbage. the Americans. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Or and actually what you do is you sell out the domestic market. So you sell it within China or you send it to get like flavored or whatever. But what's cool about it is to move the, and this is a little hard to see uh, if you're not looking at it, but to advance your worker in the factory to dry out the tea and eventually be able to, to sell it. You have to put more workers in the fields because the columns or the rows all line up. And the more workers are in the same row, the further everybody gets to move in the factory. So you're trying to plan out where to put your when to put your worker into the factory based on what other players are doing, because like, ah, they have to go into the field, which is going to advance me for free. And they have these historic events that might give in-game scoring after every mm-hmm. round. Really interesting. It's really hard to do things like I think in a good way, you know, kind of like playing Feudum, which you've played Feudum. Oh, yeah. You know how it's really hard to do everything? Yeah. Like, I just want a food. That's all I want is one (laughs) food. It's not quite that hard, but it's that same vibe. It's very hard to do things. Very interesting game. It's coming to crowdfunding at some point this month. Really interesting. I'm not my wife didn't didn't love it. 
she thought she liked it and then she wanted to do some stuff other way you, you can't do that well why not it's like because because that's the rule so i don't like that rule like, well that's right <laughs> I, can't, I can't help you on that that's the rule so how um, how heavy is this game right when you start to explain it it sounds like there's a Vital Lacerda type vibe to it, which is you're sort of leeching off other players and working together in a semi-cooperative way. Uh, and, you know, you said it's hard to sort of understand when you're you're chaining things. You have to do this to get that done. I think of the Vital Lacerda games like that. I'm looking at a, a copy of this Formosa T and it looks gorgeous. It looks like a an old school kind of Euro. Mm -hmm. There seems to be a lot of, it seems to be at least, effective, uh, you know, graphic design here that helps you out. I'm guessing it's not that heavy, but no, it probably has not. some depth. It's one of those. It's one of those games that there's there's moving parts that you stop and you explain them all individually, but the real challenge is making them work together because mm -hmm. it's it's actually very simple. You move through the factory when someone goes into the field, but it's just you have to understand that by going into the field, it's going to move everybody. And if you go into the field before you have someone in the factory, well, maybe you're wasting your turn. And if any of your tea is wet, then all of the tea is wet because you can't put, you know, right. If you got one stinky, dirty sock in your laundry, all of your laundry is now stinky and dirty. Ruins the whole thing, man. And that's exactly what happens here. So it's, it's, it's relative. It's pretty thematic. I, I'm, I actually liked it, liked it a lot, but it, you just gotta, we gotta play with the right people because it, it's a little bit fiddle, uh, fi uh, particular, not fiddly. It's particular. Like, no, no, no. You do it this way. This is how you do it. And it didn't help that it came to me right from the factory. They accidentally sent me a German copy. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't help. And, and so. Don't I, you get to really test out that graphic design. Yeah, right. And so I emailed them. They're like, oh, I said, well, the, the rule book for the old versions on BGG, because you can download that. And so, but they've made a few changes. And so I was like, I don't know what this symbol means and so i'm like flipping through the german rule book i'm like okay you know because technology is so great you know google lens it will literally take a picture and translate for you yeah so but i couldn't find the thing so eh, there are some things there but it, it's an it's a really interesting game really interesting I, I don't i don't know how much i love it yet but also it's a super small box which oh is it oh, oh it's is this part of those small box kind of oh it, it, i mean it's, it's like kind of going right now it's not like it's not like a tiny tiny but it's it's a uh like this thing tick to ride box it's mm -hmm. maybe a little bit thinner and like chop mm -hmm. maybe a quarter off the width gotcha okay so it it's a decently small box in the world of you know board games right all right so what's the next thing you've been playing lately so the next thing I've been playing is one I actually played for the first time about a week and a half ago, and I've played it three times since. It's going to be one of our upcoming review games, I think, and that is a game called Aquatica. And Aquatica is basically, the theme of it is that you are um, you are mighty ocean kings. And so you have uh, you know a king in your little uh, hand management deck. And what you're doing is you are hiring new people to come into your 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 tribe, and you're also exploring locations to build your tableau. And you know, I really like really good tableau builders, though everything gets compared to Res Arcana. So this tableau builder is weird because when you get a location, you actually slide it in a slot on your board, and there's different depths. And those depths are sort of like you slide the card up to get different benefits. So at any given time, you can have up to five locations, all at different depths that give you different benefits by doing actions. Those actions are played from your hand. So on your turn, you basically play one of those cards from your hand. You start with six. Everybody starts with the same six. And your king, your ocean king, you play a card and it allows you to do something like recruit another person or I should say uh, ocean dweller, right? Or it allows you to attack a location or it allows you to buy a location or it allows you to take all your cards back in your hand, that kind of thing. Uh, so the idea is that as you conquer locations, they give you benefits like more money or more attack power. So if you do an action, you take make use of those benefits and slide the cards up. The reason this is critical, they give you that benefit, but once you slid the card all the way up, which is some number of depths, up to five, uh, when you slide it all the way up, you can then score it by turning it over and it has a certain point value. So the idea is that you're making use of the cards at their different depths to get benefits, and then you slide them all the way up, you do other actions to score those cards. And there's different 
uh, in-game objectives, depending on these random tokens that you're going for. The beauty here is it's a nice tableau builder where your tableau is constantly changing and updating. And in order to score points, you have to sort of use powers or advance those things. Uh, other than Res Arcana, and I would even say Race for the Galaxy, because I think of that one as sort of a close second to Res Arcana. Other than those two, this is one of the best tableau builders I think I've ever played. It's easy to teach. It's easy to play. It is gorgeous. I've only played with the expansion. There's another expansion coming out. But, yeah, I'm just really impressed by this game. And the funny and you, thing you talk is about it's been out attacking. five years. Uh, so it's yeah. like you actually, it's like aggressive against other players or is no. it you're attacking the board? The locations themselves, these cards, have an attack power on them. So you have to meet or exceed that. There's also a, a, a cost on them. So you could you could generate that many coins to sort of buy the locations. So there's different ways, those two different ways to get the locations. Um, some special cards let you do other things to get locations, which is very, you know, thematic and intriguing. So you're sort of building up an engine, but the engine is constantly changing. And that's... A, not normal for a lot of tableau builders, right? A lot of tableau builders, you're building something and then you just goose it a few times. This is, you're building something and it is constantly morphing and you're scoring things and you're rebuilding and tinkering. So the things you do in mid game are very different from the things you're doing early game and the very different things you're doing late game. And the fact that it's so dynamic and changing like that is really, really refreshing. Uh, how, On top how, of that, how, it's a beautiful game. Yeah, I was just looking at uh, some of the... the 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 fish art and all that yeah uh it does it's it's, it's pretty i mean it's blue it's real blue it's really blue it's got yeah, that but... abyss vibe to me if you like the the artwork in abyss it has that vibe going oh talk one of the most disappointing games i've ever played in my life i'm the same way people love that game oh. i i thought that what game was okay but i did like the artwork quite a bit yeah, i was so excited about that game and just was so disappointed but you're saying i'm not gonna be disappointed if i try this one i don't think so this is a this is a real winner in fact, when I showed it to my buddies in my regular Friday night uh, game group, we started playing. We played one game, and my buddy Lee said, uh, I'm buying this game immediately. He's like me. He likes those tableau builders. So everybody yeah. liked it quite a bit. Yeah, I think tableau building is probably, you know, if I had to pick a mechanic, it's probably my favorite. I really, you know, if I can combo them, like that's because it makes you feel smart. You know? Yeah. Just, this game does that, right? You line stuff up. So that you do an attack and normally you only get like one power on attack or maybe three and like you get eight because you've comboed so many different depths you have on these cards. And then you manipulate the cards and slide them up faster and score them. You can do these combo kind of turns. It's uh, really cool in that regard. Yeah. Well, put it on the list after Robinson Crusoe. There you go. And that's Aquatica. I mean, it's just, it's easy to remember the name. It's the probably designer hasn't box. done anything else. You can bring it yeah, to three. There you go. <laughs> it should fit on the plane. Yeah. The um so then the next one, and actually I think you would probably like this one. This this next one I'm talking about. It's an upcoming, I think in just a couple of weeks to crowdfunding trick taking kind of area control game called Power Vacuum. And so the ruler has died. And so of course there is a power vacuum. And now you're trying to take over. Of course, the ruler was a literal vacuum, and you were all playing. <laughs> different appliances think like you know if the brave little toaster went dark and grew up that's what's happening here gotcha and so you know you might be the toaster you might be the the television whatever but it's a trick taker and so what's cool about this is and the it's a you know, normal trick taker you must follow you gotta got a trump suit and all that but you can look at the backs of everybody's cards and you know what suits they have in their hand except there's a spy suit and the spy suit only beats the Trump suit, beats nothing else. It loses to everything else. So you have this, and, and the backs of the cards of the spy suits are lies. Mm. So I can look and see, like, oh, Don, Don's only got, uh, only has uh, uh, yellows. So I can play my Trump suit, I'll be safe. And then suddenly Don throws down the spy and he's won. And so you're going to get points or power based off of how many tricks you win. But every person who loses, whoever has the, the, the lowest number played, gets to manipulate the area control board. And so there's like plugs, and each person's assigned to one of the different appliances, and they have their power, which is literally like little lightning bolts. You know, it's plugs. power and power. And so whoever loses gets to take one power from one plug and move it to the thing it's connected to, and then move the plug somewhere else. 
And that's important because you, each person has their own appliance that they're playing for. So you're going to get whatever points they have at the end of the round, their power. But also you have a secret agenda, which has a thumbs up, thumbs down as a double sided card. And when you play it, it says the TV is going to have the most influence and the blender is going to have the least or whatever. Or you could flip it the other way around and be like the blender is going to have the most TV is going to have the least. But the sooner you play it, the more points it's worth if it happens. But of course, then you have to play through the rest of the round or you can keep it hidden and you'll get zero points if you fail it. But if you get them both, you get 16 points. It's so weird and it's great. Really? Cool. Yeah, it's it's just such a novel little take on trick taking. Like it's it's so weird. Oh, and the winner is the first person to build their, you know, uh, dictatorial statue to themselves. Oh, I saw the statues, the little yeah, screen print that, maples. Yeah, you, each piece is like, you know, 10 points or whatever. You you know, so you're just kind of building it as you go. It's so weird. It's so cool. I, you know, it's got a solo mode and whatever, but, you know, you play that with three, four. I think this is going to be a brilliant con game. Like, you know, you take that with you to Origins or something, you know, it's like 30, 40 minutes. It, it's really cool. It's really cool. So is this one coming straight to retail then? It's not going to be crowdfunding? No, of course it's going to crowdfunding. Everything goes to crowdfunding. Okay. I was, I was asking. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, it's, it's, uh, uh, I, cause I know you don't do any crowdfunding based on. Not at all. I have to dip my toe. You had to give it a try <laughs> one time, but it's, it, it's really, it's really clever. The whole thing where you can see the other players cards and mostly know what they have adds a really cool level of strategy as you're, you know, kind of hold it. Cause the best thing is, if you know, if I play a low number Trump suit and I win, I both win the hand and get to manipulate the board because it's whoever plays the lowest number, like literal number, gets to manipulate the board. It's very, it's very cool. I like those trick takers with twists, right? Um, one of the ones I don't know if you have played recently, but that I played was Cat in the Box, and that's an interesting take on this as well, right? Where you sort of define the suits of the cards as you play them, but once you declare yourself out of a suit, you can't any longer play that and so you get these sort of collisions where you know somebody is forced to play something that's already been played and of course there's an anomaly and they lose points this kind of thing but it's a really kind of cool take on trick taking and when i was younger i mean we had you know we would play hearts and we'd spades. Play spades tons of spades man when i was in college we played spades in the dorm all the time like in the you know the shared rec room area on a saturday night that place would be full of people like four or five tables going all spade games. And uh, that was a ton of fun. It really made me love these trick takers. So I love to see games that are either trick takers or ladder climbing games that add this, this twist to that. So this sounds like another one in, in that line. It's, it's cool that it plays well. I've checked this one out. And I, you know, I said, yes, I'd cover it because of the pun. And I was like, you know what? That's a power vacuum. Yeah. I was like, your pun game solid. I'm in. And I didn't know. Like, is anything about the, the, the appliances because it, it looks like, you know, it's this red cover with a star on it. It's like, okay, it's a military-ish kind of thing. Yeah. But then, but then, then, then you, you look closer. closer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you see, wait a second. That yeah, it's got fun art phone. on all the cards. It's got <laughs> yeah. like the, the, the uh, uh, like well, one of them, it, it's got like the the shady dealer with his briefcase. And there's, there's a guy there like buying fuses, you know, it's, <laughs> it's funny. It's all super it reminds funny. me a little bit of the art with, like, from like Cuphead. If people played the Cuphead game mm -hmm. or played, you know, the Cuphead video game, same kind of artwork. That's very uh, endearing. All right. So, so what, what's the last one you've been playing lately? So the last one I've been playing is a big game. And this is one I waited for for a while. I'm a huge fan of War of the Ring. And I'm a huge fan of Battle of Five Armies, which was, a, you know, a follow-on from the same designers. And they've done a new game, also gone to crowdfunding. Uh, this is from Simon, And it's Dune War for Arrakis. And it finally delivered. And this game is absolutely amazing. So I've played this a handful of times now, both as the Harkonnens and as the Atreides, and it is just great. So if you like War, War of the Ring, or if you like Battle of Five Armies, those games, it's very much like that. But I would say slightly streamlined from those. It's it's definitely more streamlined than uh, War of the Ring. It has a lot of in common with Battle of Five Armies in that you're positioning around you know certain types of terrain on Dune. Uh, it's very cool because, you know, the Atreides are allied with the Fremen. And so the sandworms come out, they're little sandworm mimmies, and they allow you a lot of flexibility and mobility. So the idea is the Atreides are very mobile, whereas the Harkonnens are sort of at their center of power right there in the middle of the dune landscape. 
But it's just like War of the Ring and Battle of Five Armies. If you roll some dice, those those dice determine the actions you can take in a round. Um, but I found that they've done a really good job in streamlining combat. And if you think about War of the Ring, I don't know if you played these, War of the Ring or Battle of Five Armies. No, the I'm combat can, the ba- combat can be a little convoluted. Now, once you play it for a while, it becomes second nature. But if I were to teach someone War of the Ring right now, I'd have to go back and really look at the combat rules, right? Uh, same thing for Battle of Five Armies. I wouldn't have to do that for Dune War of Arrakis because combat is very quick, very streamlined. And that was a really good move because it's made the game move a lot faster than those other two games. So you get the same amount of enjoyment, um, but in like half the time. It's, it's, it's a, a really trips to the map area control game. Is that what this is? That's exactly what it is. Or objective based, try to get points, right? Mm-hmm. The, um, you know, the, the House of Trades player can get points by taking over strongholds or by moving certain tokens up by, by accomplishing objectives. Meanwhile, the Harkonnen player is just trying to destroy stuff out there and take it, take, you know, kill, you know, get some of the locations the Atreides have. And they start like as the uh, military powerhouse. They're stronger. Like I said, Atreides is building up. Oh, so so that they're the cats. And yes, the- exactly. Exactly right. So think about cats versus birds. Yeah. And the Atreides house is sort of like the birds, right? They build up power where the Harkonnens lose a little bit of power over time, but they start as a powerhouse. And their their power uh, relies on them actually harvesting spice with their harvesters. And so the Atreides player has some interesting decisions about whether to go after the harvesters and try to decrease the amount of things that the Harkonnen player can do or whether to go after strongholds. And likewise, when they switch that, the Harkonnen player switches what they're protecting or what they're trying to do. So it's this nice back and forth Really is this just a two player game? game. It is a two player game. You can play it up to four, but it has, I think, the same type of design as Star Wars Rebellion okay. or War of the Ring in that you can play it four players. It really is a two player game. When you play it four players, you break out responsibilities a bit and that waters it down a little bit. Can you play it with three or four players? Yes, you can. But it's really a two player game. But you're part. still just going to go ahead. It's, it's uh, exactly because you think about Dune, you think about that. Old Gale Force Nine, you're gonna play 37 hours, and there's <laughs> 12 factions, and yeah. no, not like that at all. It's really just those two sides: House Trades, House Arconan, kind of going at it. The minis are cool, the production's good, the rule book's good, everything is game. Game is just great. How, how long does it take to play? So it says because when you the ring was like a eight. three four hour game, yes. right? Yeah. You can play this in a couple hours. I think two and a half hours is probably a realistic time. Once you get experienced, you can get it in in two hours if you're both very familiar with it. But yeah, it's more like a two and a half hour game. But it accelerates, builds to a crescendo, plays really well. Um, right? It's so funny. It's it's ranked 2,154 on Board Game Geek. I think over time and as it gets more exposure, that'll go up. I mean, that's very fast to be down to 2,000. I mean, the, the Board Game Geek, I mean, maybe you want to understand how the math on that stuff works. Um, but Nobody it, understands that stuff, man. <laughs> it's just one guy back like, I don't know. Right. They're rolling dice in the back. Yeah. <laughs> it's just well, well, one dude, that they, they give him Rice Krispies and beer, and it's like, yeah, just keep going. The big um, thing here, though, is if you're a fan of Dune, the books or the movies, the mythology, um, all that comes out very strong in the game, right? Very much like those previous games by these designers. They make sure the theme comes through. So I can so turn I think into this a sandworm. Really good... You can. In fact, they have the what is the old man of the desert? It's this massive sandworm miniature that I don't think I'll ever go to use, but that comes in the game as well. At least in the Kickstarter version or the crowdfunding version I got. Yeah. There, well, you know, paint it. See, something for you to paint. The nice. beauty of it, it's already light brown. It's like that's the color you would paint it. Yes, yeah, done, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's you, right. You, you just you just put a single dot or something on there, be like, yeah, I painted it. <laughs> the, all right. So the, the last one for me is a game called Fractal. And I don't know if you wound up getting this one. I did, but I haven't played it yet, so I'm dying to hear about oh, it. Oh, man. So you know, I, I'm pretty familiar with, with, with Fractal go, going going all the way back. And this is this came out at the same time as Voidfall. So everyone was putting Voidfall and this together. And they're, they're nothing alike other than their 4X games. This is a no luck just about 4X game. And, you know, it's got all your classic 4X, you know, you got your hex tiles, you're moving around the board, you got your asymmetric factions and all this stuff. But what really makes it for me is combat. You have cards and you can only play cards that correlate with your units. So there might be ground assault. Well, if you don't have any ground units, you can't use that. And it on the card, it says this is what it does. And each card has an initiative. 
And so you're playing this game of like, not poker, but trying to predict what the other person is going to do. Cause clearly I have all these mechs. So clearly I'm going to do my mech assault, but I know, you know, that, so you're going to start with your ground defense card, which would nullify most of my mech assault. So maybe I'm going to start with an orbital assault and you're just playing these cards trying to predict what the other person is going to do and your technology, you're going to upgrade and get better cards and get to break different rules. All that's great. But what makes it work so well is it has this, and I, I assume you went all in. That's a silly thing. Of course I did. Yes. It's a silly thing to say. Is Because it's gorgeous. It looks so good. Oh, yeah. The, 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 the rule book's a little bit rough. Yeah. Agreed. I've read through it. Yeah. So it's, but once you get, there's some great player agents. Stuff. Once you get past that, mm-hmm. The really cool thing is it has these various campaigns that you can do. And so the main game, you play through the campaign. And as you go through one faction, factions get stronger and weaker and new factions get introduced. And you play through all these scenarios. But what we've been playing lately is the cooperative Mm. campaign just to try it out. And we played one the other night. It was a 35 minute game. No way. 35 minutes and there was zero combat in the scenario. It was a combatless scenario where we're trying to expand fast enough before the, you know, the world gets destroyed. And it was really cool. If the whole, whoop, just threw my pen. If the whole thing was like that, I'd say, okay, this isn't great, but that all these cooperative scenarios are so very different <laughs> is just so cool. And just the, the whole game is great. I don't like 4X games really. But this one is, if I had to do my games of the year today, it would be on the list. And Yeah, I need to play this. The only thing that keeps me from, like, breaking it out is I had it, I read the rules, and we had it lined up to play one night, and I was like, "Uh, I just don't know that I have it sort of internalized enough to really teach it. So we didn't play it. And that's been a few months ago, right? Uh, One of the things I was a little bothered by is it's, really small text it's, it's, there's explanations about everything you need to do but there's small text on the cards and play rays and things like that so if you're like me sort of older and i challenged uh you have to wear your readers make sure they're set to <laughs> translate uh yeah. because there's a lot of words which adds a variability and theme to the game and everything is you know we talk about this text but the reason the text small is it leaves a lot of room for great art i mean this artwork in the game is yep. absolutely beautiful and so it really draws you to play this game. And the, the very cool thing about the thing that I think is very unique about it is it has, so each round's going to end after all players have taken two action cards. So you have all the stuff that you can do that everyone can do. It's a little bit different based on how you built up your, uh, your, your tableau, but there's four action cards out that are super powerful do totally different things. And at any time on your, your turn, you can take an action to take one of those and do the thing. But once you've taken two, you're done for the round. And so there's this kind of push your luck, waiting for these things to be taken. And well, if I take this one now and I want to wait till one better comes out, it's just really good. It's just a fantastic game. I, the, the only four X game that at all competes for me would be eclipse yeah. second edition and I think this is better. And no way. I without wow. question. Wow. Without question. Because the combat's so much more interesting, I think. Mm-hmm. And now, to be fair, I have my void fall sitting right here. I haven't played it. I've been trying to get to the table. It hasn't happened yet. So I, everyone says that's great. Don't come at me. I haven't played that one yet. I've heard that's great too. I haven't played either one. The fact that you would say that this fractal is sort of even comparable to an eclipse means a lot because eclipse is thought of. Uh, as sort of the prototypical 4X in space game, unless you want to go real hardcore with the Twilight Imperium series. Yeah, no one wants to do that. Um, exactly. That's just in-depth. That's just in-depth. <laughs> so I definitely have to get to the table. I knew I was hyped up to play it. Like I said, you know, it just missed it one week and it hasn't gotten back into the rotation It's, it's just that 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 combat. I mean, the, the Eclipse combat's really fun. You know, you're building your ships, you have different dice and stuff. But that little head-to-head... I'm going to outthink you with the combat is just so satisfying. Yeah, um, it sounds intriguing. Yeah, it's great. You, you, you need to play it, you know, now. All you know, right. When, when you wake up next time in the middle of the night, go wake up your son and say, we're playing this. <laughs> That'll go All right. good. All right. So we'll, we'll go quick through what we have on our table to, to be played next. What do you got coming next? Yeah. So I backed again. I shouldn't say back. I picked up a game called Deliverance. 
And this is where you're Jesus. commanding. Exactly. Well done. <laughs> So this is uh, actually designed by a devout Christian. So it's one of those things where, you know, I mean, depending on how you think about things, right, or, or your personal views, you could see these kind of things as sort of mythological encounters or historical or, or you know, uh, um, real world type things happening behind the scenes. So uh, this is where you are basically, and I'm reading off board again, commanding legendary angels against demonic foes. And it's very, very cool. There are followers out there, these little tokens, and you're trying to sort of be around them and protect them while demons are trying to attack them. And so there are different campaigns you can play. It sounds like, I've read the rules, but we haven't played it yet. It's a cooperative game where you're, you know, you all have sort of an angel. And imagine something like a Descent where you have your specialized character and they have special powers. Uh, I love the fact that uh, it doesn't seem to beat one over the head, uh, you know, with the religious aspect of things. But at the same time, that stuff is there. The reason I got it is I've got a buddy, Shannon, and he's... Um, <clears throat> relatively devout Christian as well. And so I'm always intrigued by these games that have Christianity as a backdrop. We played uh, Jerusalem, which starts with an I, not a J, Jerusalem, uh, Anno Domini, I believe it's called. And that was an interesting game because he was sitting there and he's like, oh, I know what this, this is the parable of the, you know, whatever, the parable, we, you know, there's, it's trading fishes and loaves. And it's like, oh, this is, and he loved it so much that I saw this and I was like, let me pick up this game because it sounds like it's a really good game and it's got a theme. He would, uh, Appreciate yeah, it I, I've heard nothing but from people who are deep into dungeon crawl types of games like I am. Just virtually everyone I've heard talk about it. Most of the complaints have been too Jesusy. Yeah. Okay. Fair. So theme you don't like that. Fair enough. Or you don't, or or you don't want to play that. You know. You know yeah. this kind of thing. Or but uh, uh, it, some other kind of maybe maybe rules or balance or maybe something like that. But everyone seems to say it's a very, very good game. I, I have not played it. I've not played it. I've read the rules, and it, it, it the rules read simple. Uh, it's eight point seven rated on Board Game Geek. So whatever you you know faith or stock you put into that faith, huh? See what you do uh, see what yep, you do whatever faith you put into that suggests it's a good game. And the rules suggest it's a good game too. And I read it's like, okay, this sounds interesting. Um, but anyway, that's on the list to be played within the next couple of weeks. Well, I'm I'm glad you talked about about the rules. Because that brings me to the next one I, I got to play, which is Skull Tales Full Sail Second Edition. Now, this is a pirate dungeon crawler, which got me excited. And it's got three modes that you play in. It's got the basic kind of dungeon crawls called the adventure phase. And there's a port phase where you buy stuff and level up and do maybe little adventures. And then there's a sailing phase. And when this game came out, I think it was a Kickstarter, I don't know, four or five years ago. It was unplayable. Because the rules for, I think, the sailing thing just literally was unplayable. And if you go look at the ratings, there's all these ones and twos because it's unplayable. But it's everything I've heard is for the people who stuck with it and got the clarifications and waited for all the stuff, it's brilliant. So they actually reached out out of the blue and like, our second edition is coming, new rule book. We divided it up into three separate books for each thing and whatever is going to make sense and all of this. And we've done, and they did a super small print run. So the copy I have is exactly what backers will get for the core game. And then the expansions are new stuff. So this has been sitting there and it, it did not travel well. Like <laughs> It looked like you jumped up and down on it. I mean, the box was split. Like I was doing surgery. Everything inside was okay. But I'm super excited. To, I've been reading through the first rule book, and it all makes sense. But that's the one that always made sense. I haven't gotten to the weird ones yet. So I'm super excited. I love me a pirate game. Like, yeah. our, our, our romanticized version of pirates, I love that. You know, you stop and think about what a pirate actually was. It's like, that's not cool, bro. That's not cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. But, you know, my Jack Sparrow level pirate, like, I, I love that. I'm excited about it. I cannot wait to play this thing once I get through it all. I'm so excited by it. Yeah, I'm looking at it. It looks good. It's got some cool little miniatures. I mean, it looks like the kind of game. It's like if if they pulled this off, you know, we're always looking for a really thematic, fun pirate mm -hmm. game. And everyone that we've played, at least, me and the groups I've been a part of, it's like it misses a little bit. P probably the best one amongst all of them is like your, your Merchants and Marauders, right? But that's a particular type of game. It's not like this, which is a skirmishy kind of, you know, minis moving around a map. Oh, and the so, cool thing is, so one of you is the captain, and I love this part of the game. Might drive some people away. As you're going through, depending on what you do, you get more fame. 
If you wind it with more fame than the captain, you can be like, mutiny. I'm <laughs> the great. captain now. And it's like a whole thing that happens, which I just, I find that so thematic and amazing. You know, like you can be play the cabin boy and be like, I'm the captain now. If you've been amazing enough. So I'm very excited about it. You know, I'll, I'll be talking about it again, but Excellent. fingers crossed. I'm forward to hear about it. Because it looks good, man. It's the kind of game you look at, you're like, I want it to be good, right? Yes. Just, oh, I want it to be so, like, a part of me has been reading the rules slower because I'm like, I don't want to mess up. Yeah. Because, like, yeah. a part of me is like, this is going to be a hot mess because of its history. So, you know, we, we shall see. All right. So what's the last one you've been, you, you got coming up next? The last one I have here is a relatively um, popular, and I would even venture to say famous game that has been around for a while in a previous version. So the, the previous version of it was called Claustrophobia, and that came out way back in 2009. And this is a two-player game where it's sort of a dungeon crawler kind of game where one side's playing the demons in the catacombs that are sort of coming at you in waves, and one person is playing the a priest uh, with prisoners that have been sort of drawn to go down there by the priest and fight. So you have two kinds of figures as the good guy. You have I shouldn't say the good guy because it's very gray area here, right? Uh, but this is, uh, you know, one player is going to control these humans and the priest is sort of the mage of the group or could have multiple priests, I guess. And then you have these criminals and criminals are like these rogues or these brutes. And so it's a skirmish kind of game hidden in here. Meanwhile, the other side is controlling some big demon and also some of these minions that are going at them. So, so you're pitching to me that the demons are the good ones? Hey, it could be. I, all I'm saying is... You need to I'm go read is, that deliverance rule book <laughs> to understand how this is supposed to work. But the rule book suggests, for instance, that the, the the criminals that are going down in there are not going out of the goodness of their heart or whatever. They're like being forced to go down there because they are prisoners. They say, look, you're going to fight. And so you get down in there. So it's a, it's a little morally vague whether or not that is well, the right you know, thing. No, it's do. either that or make license plates. But it's very cool. The original game was a relatively streamlined two-player game. And my buddy Jamie, right, the host of the Secret Ball Game podcast, he said that uh, this new version streamlines it down even further and sort of cleans up all the things that need to be cleaned up from the original game, which I liked a lot. So I need to get this thing to the table. I've actually had it for about five years, but I never have played it. You know how it goes when you got these shells of games. Some just get out of the rotation, never make it back in. I've got a two-player game coming up, uh, two-player game night coming up with my buddy Lee this weekend, and I think this is going to be the one that hits the table. All right, so my, my last one, I'm actually I'm playing in like an hour and a half. Really? And that is uh, Tales from the Red Dragon Inn. That was my game of the year last year. Just the best light dungeon crawl to come out in the past four years. Without question. It's I, I've talked about it so many times, but it's wonderful writing awesome gameplay, incredibly unique scenarios in that they put the AI for the monsters on the map, and it's just a big old piece of paper that you fold out, map done, fast to set up, and they just had to get so much mileage with every thing, single thing in that game. It's just, it's just great. I'm not going to go on about it forever other than say, if you like a lighter dungeon crawl, you're not going to find a better one. This makes sense to me. I haven't heard about this one, to be honest. I have to check it out because, you know, um, the Red Dragon Inn, that original game was a very streamlined kind of game. So I can imagine they would take something like a, a skirmishy dungeon crawl game and make it streamlined, which, to be honest, I really enjoy those kind of games because, it you know, it takes a lot of that complexity and sort of strips it out and just lets you get on with what you want to do, which is delve into that dungeon, roll some dice. And do some damage. Yeah, they've even abstracted out with, you know, rule of cool, some stuff. So like a uh, line of sight, you just count the hexes and it's like, well, but it's around the corner. It's like, well, yeah. So you just bounced your dagger off the wall, whatever. Move <laughs> That's on. That's right. You can do that. Like it even has a, like the wizard even has a card. It says, yeah, lightning bolts go around corners. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> like it's just, it's, 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 it's just fantastic. It's, it was my, my, my game of the year last year. And there's some really good stuff I played last year. It, it's so good. It sounds cool. Enjoy. All right. So our topic we're going to talk about, we don't have to spend forever on it because I think we're going to spend most of the time talking about the, the, the first one on the list. Call it a crowdfunding shenanigans. All right. So people are always doing something to try to, you know, make more money because the got to be different. Yeah. yeah and the margins are, Lock the them margins in. are tight. Margins are tight. And I've been in some Facebook debates with people lately. 
And, you know, a couple of content creators have made videos about it. The latest one is this $1 pre-pledge pledge. So you give a dollar to the company before the Kickstarter launches, and they're going to give you a thing, whatever, an expansion. And you're just saying, I'm pledging to you that I'm going to pledge when you launch. And then you got to go pay the money when it launches. <laughs> Why are you going to do that anyway? Yeah, yeah. So, I, I mean, have you seen this? Yes. Okay. So, to, what, what do you, what I've do you done think? It. About I did it one time until I was like, wait, this is just stupid. Why am I doing this? Because I'm going to see it when it launches anyway. I'm going to pledge. It's going to be fine. It's like, it's not like right, not but you're going to get the gonna... free expansion by giving them the dollar early, the non refundable dollar early. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, man. I'm willing to take my chances and wait, to be honest. Yeah. It, it's just, and people are super up in arms about it. Um, and now, so I don't like it. And I know some companies, some people, some publishers that, that, that have done it. And, you know, they said we do it because this is like, yeah, whatever. I don't like it because it's just one more step. Yeah, I agree with you. You know, it's, it's one more step that I have to do. And, you know, part of the thing about the one dollar pledge is I can go back and look later and be like, mm, I'm out. Like yeah. even when they have the first 48 hours bonus, like I'll go and I'll, I'll make my pledge and then learn about it and drop out later. But I don't want to give you my dollar now. And then because that means I got to do all my research now. Mm. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. It's also and only it, a dollar. Like, I, you know, I live in California, but, like whatever. Yeah. Minimum wage is like $80 out there. So uh, in fact, it went up. I know it's it $20 for fast food. Yeah. $20. I saw that. It was 16 and that went up to 20. Yeah, yeah. Now, but now for people listening, you do not understand how much everything costs here in California. Like. You go to Taco Bell for one person, you're going to pay $13. Mm. So, I mean, it's, this is no Alabama prices here. Taco Bell, though, you get like 27 tacos when you spend that. No, that's what I'm saying. I'm you get, you get like two. About how small they are. These little, this is a quesadilla. What are you talking about? This yeah, is we, a time. We, 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 we've shifted to bashing Taco Bell. Um, <laughs> yeah, Come but, on, they deserve it. It's Taco Bell. Yeah, it's so your now podcast. The, the, you're the one got to deal with it. Now, so, so the interesting, hey, if Taco Bell wants to sponsor me, I will say nothing but nice things about Taco Bell. You know, chalupas for everybody. Um, <laughs> but so like on the surface, like I've seen some people talking about how like, oh, these are, you know, uh, 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 underhanded and predatory practices. I'm like, this is no subprime mortgage. <laughs> Don't pay the dollar. It's like, easy. What do you mean predatory? It's like FOMO. Yeah. I'm like, they already <laughs> use FOMO. Like Simon has made a business out of FOMO. You know, it's like, oh, you got to be back now. Get all this extra stuff that no one's going to get. Oh, here's your stretch goal. Give us more money for, you know, like, yeah, whatever. But it's all come from this one. It seems like this marketing company called Launch Boom. Mm. It seems like they like someone there had this idea and like they've started doing it. And it's been happening what for like three months, maybe. Yeah, it had been long. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, so what, what do you think about this? Like, I've been babbling about it. Like, what, what do you think? I think it's ridiculous. Here's the reason. You said it yourself. It's like, it's not about the dollar. It's really not about the dollar. It's about the principle of it. And I, the issue I have is like, think about, you know, you have access to a game on a certain day. And I'm, I mean, you have the box in hand, right? So things that hit retail, you can go get them that day. We're, we're finding that the awareness of the game is stretching back further and further, right? Because something's going to be available. Let's say, I'm just completely making this up. March 26, you know, 2026 it's like if something hits kickstarter today you're looking at you know late 25 at best maybe in the 26 a lot of things are going to get stretched into 27 that's just the way these things work right so there's already like a two-year lead time from where you originally become aware of something when you have it in hand and we're stretching that back even further right we're seeing not only the one dollar pre-pledge but also like advertisements a year in advance of something that's going to hit a crowdfunding campaign in a year. It's like, really? At some point, we're going to be talking about games we're not going to have until 2050. Uh, you know, I just don't know that I, I need this sort of long, But you time. need that now for when your grandson turns 15. <laughs> so you need to know now. You know? It's definitely, it's definitely, I can understand why they're doing it because they want to lock in. They want to make sure you have, if you drop or you don't want it, there's a cognitive distance and a FOMO, as you said, that sets in. So I understand why they're doing it, 
but I don't know that I want to feed that why. It's like, whatever, I'll wait till it hits. And now I've gotten to the point where if I see an interesting crowdfunding campaign, I'll just click the remind me button or the love button. And that way it'll remind me a couple of days before it closes. And then I'll, at that point, once the immediacy of the moment has passed me by, I can make a better, more objective decision. For Check instance, back I just later for with... Don's new show, Don's <laughs> Love Button. <laughs> right. So yeah. I did this recently with Shogun, right? Shogun is like my immediate, oh, I need to back that because it's great. And I remember it's like, but it's never going to hit the table. You know, there are other games out here that sort of scratch that itch. I still have the original version. It's like, I don't need this. And so I just sort of, you know, didn't back that thing. And so that kind of, I, I think the window is just right between a, Pledge manager, or sorry, you know, a crowdfunding campaign opening, and when it closes, to sort of think about it and make that decision. I don't need to stretch stretch back any further, and I sure don't need to stretch back at the cost of a dollar to me. Well, and it's not even so much the the dollar for me why I don't like. Now, don't get me wrong. So the 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 publishers, and I think I don't actually blame the publishers. I, I think this is on, on Launch Boom, who is you know pushing this and helping publishers with their marketing and all this stuff. They have not because they say, well, no, this has helped the small publishers understand the blah, 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 blah. They have not explained that well. Yeah. I'm like, so you just want my dollar like that. That's in like, you know, and I have a a, a, a publisher friend and they have their and they're, they're doing it for this tiny campaign they have coming up. And I, was, and I asked him, I was like, how is that going? And he's like, the dollar thing is not working for us. Mm. So, you know, they've made like, I don't know. One hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah. Like, like, what are you going to do with that? That's that's what eight meals at Taco Bell, right? And um, it's not really an indicator, right? You think they could use it as an indicator? I can't yeah. imagine that it's a very consistent indicator of exactly how much sort of uh, how many people you're going to have back campaign because so much happens via word of mouth. Yeah. Right? And if it is an During indicator, the they have that has not been communicated to yeah. the people who care. So I just. But I understand why they do it. It's like uh, I spent a long time working in theater and working in theater education and children's theater. And so, like, when the kids have a play coming up, you don't give away free tickets. You charge $2 and people show up. You know, if you give them away for free, 70% of people don't show up. But for whatever reason, you charge, like, 2 bucks, 70% of people actually show Worth up. Worth some, yeah. Exactly. And so I get it. It's like, well, I'm not going to drop my dollar pledge because I put a dollar in, even though – some of these places are giving away like $15 expansions for free. If it, I don't know. I don't like it. I don't think it's predatory. Yeah. I, I'm, and, I'm with you. You know, we've definitely got a decision here as a consumer. But yeah. I, I think it's, it had no, though it has uh, talked me off one or two campaigns that I was interested in. And it was a big thing that you would get. You know, it was like a whole $30 expansion. I was like, well, that's interesting. I was like, I don't know about the guy. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, well, ran out of time. Hmm. And, th and then, you know, I'm the type who, you know, I was like, well, I didn't get the thing. <laughs> you know, even though I will buy it in the store later, you know. Right. So. And I'll tell you what, you, you threw one other thing out there, which is expansions, right? And we see some campaigns. I'm going to switch topics a little bit. Yeah, yeah, still yeah. the same umbrella. Uh, Kickstarter shenanigans. Yep. Kickstarter shenanigans. So you see they're out there and like. They announce the game and it's that's the game. And then they'll say, Oh, okay, we've unlocked this new expansion and it's just thirty dollars more. And then a couple of days later, we've unlocked this other new expansion, thirty dollars more. And soon it's sort of stacked. Show me up. where so show me you, where where Simon hurt you, Don. Exactly. He's pointing that's, at his wallet, everybody. Hey, these are <laughs> well, the funny thing is, and I'm not advocating for this at all, but I generally don't back the CMON campaigns because of that, because I've spent a lot of money and gotten a lot of stuff, which is expansions, most of which I will never play. Right, because I don't play the base game enough to really get those expansions in. But still, the FOMO is strong with me. I want those interesting characters. And there's been just enough campaigns, like your Blood Rages, you know, your Rising Suns, uh, your Call, your uh, uh, Cthulhu Death May Dies, where it's like, oh, all these expansions are useful in those games. But then, like your Zombicides, Zombicide variants, it's like there's so many expansions there, very few of which I would play. That you know, that's uh. Again, that doesn't seem predatory because I have a choice, but it's a harder choice than that dollar we were talking yeah, about. Yeah, it's just, I guess I got all bent out of shape when I got this is predatory. And I literally, my response was, this is not subprime. Like, right. You know, this is. They're not locking you into something you need. Yeah, but it is a bad feeling. you more interest than you can afford. Yeah. It is a bad feeling that at least the vocal people 
ours. And I have not seen anybody really talking about, no, no, it's necessary. So I'm curious if in six months, are we still going to be talking about this or is it going to be just how it is or is it going to be dead? I'm leaning yeah. toward this is going to be dead. Uh, that's the feeling I get. We'll see though. I've yeah. been wrong before. Yeah. Now you did mention the, and I know why well, I brought it up first, the whole expansions. Oh, stretch goal. Give us more money. How do you feel about game found doing pre-orders now? Cause Simon's got that pre-order up there and it, yeah. I, I was looking at it. How do you feel about that? Cause some people are real upset. That doesn't bother me at all, to be honest, because uh, and I don't know if the, not at all. No, uh, our latest podcast we've recorded. I don't think it's released yet. We talk about this, and the thing is, it's like I'm not sure this is any different. I, I just don't see how it's different than what they're doing already. Many of us use crowdfunding as, as a pre-order, a pre-order yeah. system already, in a sense. So it's like I'm not sure what the big difference is here. Jamie, Jamie was making the case that from a psychological point of view, it is different. You kind of couch it differently in your brain, and maybe that's the case. Maybe I just don't see them differently, and most people will. We'll see what kind of effect it has and what kind of, you know, if it's a fad, like we think this $1 pre-pledge is going to be, or if it's sort of a, or if it sticks. We'll see. Yeah, I part. I'm almost a fan of it. I'm like, thank you for just telling us what you're <laughs> That's doing. That's right. This is the truth. And the best part about it is apparently you can actually get your shipping rate. Like, if you start going into the purchase, you can go all the way through. It says, this is how much shipping is going to cost. Oh, really? Like, which That'd, that'd we, be good. Because yeah, I've been so, burned on shipping a few times. Yeah. And uh, uh, and I, I thought about you because someone, one of my uh, uh, subscribers sent me a message with a picture of Six Siege. Oh, yeah. And he just said, I paid the ransom and this is great. <laughs> so here's the deal. I didn't pay the ransom, but enough people did that they shipped them all out. That's my understanding. Or maybe I did pay the ransom, just don't remember. And I have played it twice now. And it's great. It's really, really good. But I'm very torn over how loudly to say that, given how burned I am by some of those Mythic Games. You need to get a sticker. Uh, IPs. You need to get a sticker and put it right over where it says Mythic Games. Yeah, I guess. Because I'll tell you this, played Six Siege, and I was very pleasantly surprised with how well thought out that game was. Yeah, that's... Okay. uh. If they If Mythic Games hadn't run into this, you know, this big black guy associated with sort of selling IPs off and leaving a bunch of funders um, backers in the lurch. Uh, I would have been talking uh, six siege up because it, it's a really good game, but I don't know that I can suggest that, uh, you know, potential backers put their faith in that no, company because I've no. been burned. It's, yeah. it's going to be your dirty little secret game. A we little bit to come be down. Like, mean, all the lights are off and Don's just playing by a, uh, a, uh, uh, Cell phone light. Don't look at me. I will say, if I hadn't had three quarters of a mad elf, I probably wouldn't be talking about it with you, Will. But I, you know, I'm struck by uh, you know, my honesty's coming out. And I will say, uh, it's a really good game. If you can play it, play it. It's a good game. Uh, surprisingly good game, to be honest. I mean, I, you know, yeah, that, that's uh, that's actually everything I've heard. But you know, I just can't wait till they announce that the next one's not shipping too, and so you get to rage. That's again. just it, man. It's like is that the last one that you backed? Or do you have more uh, of those? No, out? no, no. Um, no, that's the last one of theirs I backed, other than that hail, the last saga that they sold the IP off to Simon. Oh, right, right, right. That's All another right. one. So uh right now, everybody, I just gotta say a quick sponsor bump. One thank you to Noble Knight Games for sponsoring us. If you need to get new and used games, check out Noble Knight. Use the affiliate link. It's great. Actually, to be fair, they do have a lot of games that you can't find. A lot. They have a lot of out of print stuff. So I've that's... actually ordered from Noble Noble Knight, so I can attest as well. Yeah. Well, now you need games. to use my affiliate link. Oh, okay. Here at Noble Knight Games, we've been carefully growing the world's largest selection of board games, role-playing games and dice, war games, miniatures and paints, card games, and more. Going on 25 years now. Our rustic castle contains more game and hobby goodness than you can shake a stick at. Complete with careful packaging and the finest customer service the land can provide. You can buy, sell, trade from anywhere in the world. Just like nature intended. Noble Night Games. And, of course, always please consider becoming a channel member. It's great. Isn't it great, Don? It is great, Will. See? It's great. You heard it right there from the most important man in Alabama. That's right. <laughs> That's, That's about a right. low bar. Exactly. <laughs> All right. So jumping into why the way I was able to get you to come on today, talking about 
Res Arcana, which last I heard, you said you played like 200 times? At least. I bet it's more than that, Will, in, in all seriousness. Yeah. yeah. All right. So you just... Briefly, briefly, t- t- tell us tell us what the game is about, and we'll, we'll talk about what why you like it, and that'll make you make you talk some trash about it. All right. So, Res Arcana was designed by Tom Lehman of uh, Race for the Galaxy fame, and this is a tableau building game, which we've already talked about. I love quite a bit, right? And the idea is there's a stack of cards, and you're going to draft until you have eight of these cards, and that's your deck for the entire game. Eight of out of like a hundred cards, or whatever the number is. And for these cards, you can use them to generate resources or you can pay their cost to lay them on the board. And they do a variety of things. It basically boils down to a relatively simple resource conversion engine. You want to generate, you want to convert, generate and convert resources and then trade those resources in ways that get you points, either by buying places of power that they're called or monuments if you're generating gold. And each of these places of power in the monuments have powers, just like the cards, that you can activate to trade resources in to get points. Now, when I, I'm purposefully sort of describing it in very simplistic terms, the beauty of Res Arcana is the variability and all the combo building you can do with just getting eight cards in that drafting phase. The drafting phase is the core of what makes this game great because these cards interact in very interesting ways. And so when you get them, You can build your engine, and of those eight cards, you'll probably have four or five that are sort of your core engine you want to get out out there. And then there's some cards you're just going to trade in for resources. So it's like two halves of a game. One is identifying the the tableau you want to build, the order you want to build it in, and sort of how you go through those steps. Uh, The second half of the game is actually carrying through on that plan. And you can do all this if you're experienced in the span of about 30 minutes. So really good game, packs a lot of punch. Really good artwork, really quick, easy to teach gameplay uh, from a master of game design and Tom Lehman. Yeah, so you you introduced this one to me at um, Origins because you've always been going on about it. And I was a little bit like, eh, I don't know. I mean, I like Tableau Builders. But the way that every time you play, it's it's a completely different experience because that drafting. Oh, yeah. And and there's a it's, its own game there because, boy, you can just draft the dumbest set of cards <laughs> yeah. and then you're trying to find a way like i had one game i was playing relatively recently i felt like i was doing so well and i had all this stuff and no points but i had all the stuff it felt real good yeah but you know i just had missed kind of a, one of the 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 core points to it and because you got these you know eight cards before you even start you're playing your own game you're trying to figure out okay what direction can i go and what i really like are the different mages that you can play because you get two mages that have a simple but usually pretty powerful ability and so then you're trying to draft cards that play into that and it really is a very clever game. it's one of the few games that my wife was like i want to play that again and so it, it's very very cool very simple yeah you know very simple to play very hard to master i think um i mean as as, as you know after playing 200 games you still haven't mastered it Yes. And in fact, there are new sort of strategic paths to go down because as you're drafting cards, it's like you look at those first four cards that you get because you do like two rounds of drafting four cards each round. And so you look at those four cards and like, ooh, this one card I know is a high risk, high reward card. If I can get other dragon cards or I can get other uh, creature cards or other, you know, red resource generation Mm -hmm. cards. Uh, And then there's some that just generate resource like, oh, I could go with this easy one. Or I could do something that, again, could have that high reward if I make this super combo work out. And then out. you have that, you know, because you know if I've given away a dragon card, which hurts everybody and can, you know, take away your 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 green, usually your, your green as yeah, life. your essence. life. Yeah. yeah, or you got to spend other stuff. Then you have that thing of, well, do I really want, do I want to give Don another dragon that maybe he's going to take? Maybe he doesn't. I don't know. But then you have to think, about, well, how am I going to defend against all this nonsense? As it's going around. So there's a there's a whole game before you even start. And I just it's really clever. I also really like that you just do one thing a turn. Yes. I love that. Like just do one thing. You're done. Move on. So Very discreet. Can, Trade a card in. Yeah, Use a so, power. Pass. That's about it. Yeah, because I when we were at your house, I, the, we played a four four person game, I think. And it it didn't I don't know, it probably took 35 minutes. Yeah, that's a teaching game too. Yeah, yeah. And just very because your very, wife had never played before, right? Yeah, she did never played before. And um uh i beat her that game and i beat her the first time we played when we it all got to the house 
And then she demanded I put stickers on it. And so that was <laughs> its own. I could have played five games of Res Arcana and the amount of time it took me to put all those stickers I bet. on it. Yeah. But as everybody, I'm going to put a link down in the description. The stickers for this game are great. But after that, I've never won. Like I, <laughs> I, I even sent you a picture of the one, the one picture. I was so excited. I had like seven pearls. I was like, that's how you win the game. <laughs> Narrator. And you lost. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Because <laughs> I triggered the end of the game. I was like, it's over. And then she got like six points on the last turn. And I just wanted to throw the table out the window. It's so funny. You talk about the first game you played. You thought, oh, I'm doing great things. And that's the that's one of the most enjoyable things about this game is it's very easy to build things that do stuff. But it's harder to build something that generates points for you, right? And so you can do all these things. And I've done that myself when, you know, there's this this fine balance. And so I'll realize, you know, I'll try something new. I'll be like, oof, what I'm missing and what I'm trying to do is enough resource generation or enough, you know, um, you know, I can't extend the rounds as long as I want to send it. Or I take too long and I get the the worst sort of, uh, you know, uh, order in the next round. It's like all these different parameters you're balancing. And again, this changes according to the random 32 cards that you have in that game because it's if you're playing a four-player game eight cards each 32 cards the rest of the deck out of the game like you don't see them yeah there's gotta be like maybe i don't know what 150 cards something like that i don't know what it is with because it's because it's not just the base game but there's two expansions as well oh yeah well you have to have the two expansions like get out of here. they incorporate no, no. so easily and so well into the game you got to have those so and i don't know cards it is. That's a lot there's a new expansion coming i don't know oh. when but it's coming I'll be lined up, man, because, you know, uh, you know, more of the same here. It's just adding to what I've, you know, I, at one point I never thought I would have a favorite game, but Res Arcana has become it. And the funny thing is, the first time I played it years ago, I thought, well, it's no race for the galaxy. And, and, and then the, that was before I played with the draft, you know, you just deal out eight cards. But then when I played with the draft, it's like, ooh, there's something very special here. My appreciation for this game has only gone up with each, each game I've played of it. It, it, it really, it definitely really holds up now. That said, talk some trash about it. What are the what 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 are the what are the problems with the game? I'm gonna I'm gonna make you say say what are the problems? I'll say a pro what I feel to be a problem with the game. It could be group think of my group, but there is one strategic path that seems very hard to succeed with, and that is going offensive, like the dragons out attacking stuff. The reason is the dragons attack and so when you look at them oh i could really hit people for other stuff but they're very expensive and they come with victory points usually so to get the dragons out you got to have some kind of combo out to get them you get them out but by the time you get them out people have put down cards that mitigate the attacks to a certain extent or they've built up enough resource generation that they can sort of just pay the resources because there's always some way to sort of you know to tap say do two damage or they can do something discard a card yeah. or get rid of a green to mitigate it and uh, or a blue rather or something like that, and so generally people have built up their defenses by the time you can get the dragons out. Now, what this allows me to do as a relatively experienced player is like if I'm playing with new people, I'll be like, okay, I'm going to try to go the dragon route because it's a harder route to go. So it's not completely bad, but we have found in our group at least like the dragons are really really hard to compete because you just don't have enough. If you've got enough dragons, you don't have enough resource generation. And if you have enough resource generation, you could score points faster in other ways. Yeah, it's almost like to to do that, you have to get like there's a few cards out there that definitely make it easy. Like there's like the dragon egg. Yes, you know, or the dragon like bridle. Yeah, yeah. So there, there's a there's a few cards, but if it's like if you don't have those, you know, can that work? And actually, I hadn't thought thought about that. I mean, I haven't played nearly as much as much as you have. The thing that that I, I'll point out is, you know, this got this theme of these mages and doing this stuff. I mean, not really. I'm just getting some cards to do some stuff, and I'm turning the cards and occasionally looking at the pretty art. I mean, <laughs> I do love the art, the art on the cards. It is cool. very pretty, but you know, you look at it and then you never think about it again. Like, you know, See, I'm not. I'm going to push back on you a little bit because I kind of felt the same way for a while. Then I heard, uh, um, so on Board Game Geek, if you search for it, you can find there was an interview with Tom Lehman, and he was talking about what the resources represented and what the cards are doing. And that gives you an appreciation for the theme he was trying to build into the game. So you'll see things like, you know, the mermaid is generating um, blue for you. Anything that is water or wind, that's sort of blue. Anything that's fire or earth, that's red. So it combined those four elements into two. And then the other two of the six elements you have, or the four elements rather, are life and death. And so depending on what you're laying out, 
it will generate some of those things. And that's very thematic associated with what it's doing. Or you have like, for instance, Midas, which is, is turning things into gold, right? There's theme in there. If you just take a minute to think about it, but all right. So everybody, the beauty read, of it is read you can Don's just, you dissertation. Can play it. Yes. Yeah. We read Don's, right. yeah, you know, Don has a doctorate and it's actually in <laughs> Reza Arcana. Pretty much. Reread his 300 page dissertation and then you'll be like, ah, oh, the theme really comes through. I mean, yeah. to be fair, that, that's a lot of Euro games, right? Yes. But for me, and you, I could, thought, yeah. you could play it without that theme too, as well. As you said, you sort of move these little tokens around. Yeah, I mean, it I, works I, that way too. Yeah. I, when I think about a, you know, what, a, a Euro that feels very thematic, usually I'm like, if you stop and think about it, it's there. Like I think about uh, Euphoria. Yeah. Like, you know, that a little, if you stop and like look at what it is, the theme is going to come through. But so it's not, is not super thematic, right? I mean, I appreciate the legwork that you just went on to pitch that. And I will say I was on a panel with Tom Lehman out here once. Really? And, yeah, yeah, he's a very nice guy. Yeah. But if I recall correctly, he designs his games in a spreadsheet. And so like it, it started as like a spreadsheet, which yeah. and this is not me bashing it because it is a very, it's a really good game. I like it a lot, but you know, and then it's like, theme yeah yeah it, it, but again you can play it in either one of those modes either theme appreciation or non-theme appreciation yeah. and it works i think either way yeah and the only other thing that i'll say is uh I, we mentioned it but i think you gotta get all of it yeah i like, agree you, you just you, you maybe you can play without the one that gives you the demons okay maybe but you can't play without the pearls the yeah Pearl expansion it just and they add you so add so much flexibility in that, yeah. this great uh, decision space of where to trade those pearls in, which are worth a point to get resources. Or and gold. it gives you a whole new engine that yes. you know you, you can try to make a pearl yep. engine, which yep. then you have that lovely choice of like, well, but if I just throw away some of my pearls, I could then get this other thing. And of course, you're throwing away your points. It's really clever, really clever. This was a, this was a gimme episode because I don't really have anything bad to say about the game. Um, I will add one more thing though, just really quickly. It's a very particular thing there's a card in the game one of my favorite cards called wind up man which is you can put resources on it and it generates two more of those resources when you put them on there very and, first game i played i was like this sounds cool and you're like i don't know if you should do that I was <laughs> yeah, like, that's right up, Don. It's fool's goal. <laughs> but where it's op in my opinion there's a huge uh controversial thread on this board game geek is if you plant a pearl on it it generates two pearls per turn and so that's a free two points that you're getting and so it's it's a little OP when you do that. So what we've done is we've sort of house ruled that in our group that we don't do that. But it looks like on Board Game Geek, Tom Lehman says, yeah, you can do that. Um, so it's one of the very few cases where I've taken what the designer says and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to discount that because for our group, it doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I said, oh, I had that uh, that last game where I sent a picture of all those pearls. I had the wind up man and I didn't even occur to me that that well, I was like, that doesn't seem fair. It's and not. I didn't do it, in my oh, opinion. Yeah, I'm glad I you did it. One, dang. Because I did it one time when we first did it, and it and I won running away, and I thought that was not very satisfying. It didn't seem fair. Yeah, so I'm glad you didn't cheat yourself, Will. That's what I'm saying. No, but I really would like to win the game again. <laughs> Good luck, man. Like <laughs> that at game at your house. I won then. I have not won since. Like, and I. That's why I see that picture. I was like, this is it. I have video or a uh, uh, pictorial evidence. I got seven pearls right here. It's over. And it was over. That's right. <laughs> All right. Anyhow, I'm going to let, let you get out of it because I know it's getting late over there and, and you got um, fractal to play tonight. That's right. But before I let you go, what are your gaming words of wisdom and don't 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 rehash any nonsense that you've used before and don't try to twist some weird tony topper nonsense because he lives down the street that's right I words get my of own wisdom. weird tony topper nonsense that's a tony t thing he prepares for that yeah but he so, just like real hey look this has been on every episode that we've ever done it's always true. here you know it's it metaphysical a, it must be a don thing because uh uh original don who co-hosts with me probably two-thirds of the time now he always forgets too. And so he's always going to tell, all right, so what are your gaming words of wisdom? So I'll offer something very, uh, very simple. 
<clears throat> and that's, uh, you know, always try to gather perspective. That's what I'll say. Uh, you know, we go through life and we have our ups and downs with the, the pandemic, of course. We've seen a lot of things sort of unfortunately increase, right? Like suicide rates in adolescence and, and you know, uh, mental health issues, right? So life is relatively hard on people right now. So I think taking some perspective and realize that we're all together on this rock hurtling through space at millions of miles or thousands of miles an hour. You know, you, you kind of realize you're relatively small slice of existence. Uh, and then you realize all that stuff doesn't really matter too much. So just be nice to one another. So take some perspective, be nice to one another, and just have a good time because that really at the end of the day is what life is all about. So basically what you're saying is you forgive mythic games. Let's not go that far. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 that's, a, that's a step too far. That's right. <laughs> okay. Anything less painful than what Mythic Games has there done. There you go. Is acceptable. There you go. Yeah. All right. I'm going to let you go out there. Uh, as always, said, thank you so much for, for joining me again. Everybody, there will be a link down to Secret Cabal down in the description. You're probably already there, as he discussed earlier. But if you're not, make sure you check it out. Encourage Don to go to their Discord and tell Don to get his butt out to DonCon 3 and how much you want that to happen. And as always, everybody, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, like, subscribe, share, whatever. Thank you so much for watching. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. Have a good one. Thanks, Will.